standing up in McKinney. This is According to Callus. This is episode 517. It is, however, coming out a day late. October the 27th, 2023. Uh, between issues with my voice slash sinuses and <laughs> technology, uh, we were running late. And I had two-thirds of an episode uh, done this morning, or for this morning, I should say, when the computer crashed and all was lost. So we're going to start over fresh. Okay. <clears throat> Today we're talking about another gospel. Before I get into the subject matter, let me remind you the best way that you can help me continue to grow the show, make a difference, and uh, stand in the gap is to like, share, and subscribe to this here program. You can join me on the social media. You can follow me there, both the page and the group. But the biggest thing that makes the difference is following the actual podcast itself. Go to your favorite podcatcher, uh, follow right there. And if you're feeling particularly froggy, you can go and rate and review it wherever you choose. Every little bit helps. So... I don't know that I'm going to be able to do justice, but I'm going to try and go back over this before my voice gives out again. Here we go. Another gospel written by Alyssa Childers. If you don't know who she is, she was a member of the, I guess, Christian pop band, if you will, CCM recording group, Zoe Girl. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was in the, probably the nineties and my daughters are familiar with the group and what they did, uh, I was <laughs> not uh, in that vein for sure. Um, she talks about her story of being brought up in the church, really never questioning anything, and doing the things that she felt led to do, and then she ran into a progressive pastor. <laughs> and then, of course, most of this information is on the back of her book, but what I found interesting is the pastor referring to himself as a hopeful agnostic. Well, that's uh, not a guy I wanted to be my pastor. I got to be honest, there are plenty of pastors out there that maybe don't agree on specific things or maybe they challenge you on different ideas. I have no issue with that. You know, we used to have the argument that, hey, you know, we're only going to focus on gospel issues. And that worked well until they started redefining what are gospel issues. So she wrote her book from the perspective of someone that was brought up in the church, really never had any reason to doubt or question anything. Uh, and then she ran across the pastor that rocked her world, it was part of the uh, deconstructionist movement. These are the people that basically saw it to tear apart Christianity. Um, some of us believed maybe naively so, that there was a way through it. In other words, you could deconstruct things and then come back on the other side because you've had these things challenged and you had a thought process. Now, some of us maybe went through some of, the, uh, some of that process on our own, or maybe we ran across different ideas that caused us to confront what do we believe, why do we believe it, and we grew more and became stronger because of it. That's not always the case, but in my opinion... This is something where it should be kind of a guided process. You don't want a guy leading you down the path who doesn't have any answers or worse yet has answers, but they're the wrong answers or potentially wrong answers. So she talks about the idea that she ran across this pastor and he basically undermined all the pillars of faith that she had taken for granted. She talked about the idea that If you believe these things, but you don't know why, and you don't understand the basis behind it, it leaves you fragile. It leaves you open to suggestion. And I got to tell you, I wholeheartedly agree. Oh, and I guess here I should point out, she does notate that it was the early 2000s, which would make a lot more sense, uh, being that my older daughter would have been, you know, grade school at that time frame. Well, that makes sense. Okay. In any case, she, she led a life and went down a life. And I guess I I'm summarizing because I'm looking to avoid having to go do a lot of text reading. I, but the idea is she 
goes through this and it does something to her. Now she, my, I should pause here for a second and just say, my wife turned me on to this book. She said, I should check it out. I'd really like it. Um, she also has a podcast, Alyssa Childers does coincidentally called the Alyssa Childers podcast. And she's interviewed a number of people, most notably one of the Duggar girls and, uh, Costi Hinn. And I've listened to several episodes at the encouragement of my wife. And it was, it was really interesting to see some of the corollaries, particularly out of the Duggar girl in her life, which was 10 times, hundred times worse than what mine was, but a similar vein of that Christianity was going on in my life as a young person. Um, again, much, much less, not, shouldn't even be a direct comparison, but just similar strain. So, so when you look into this and she is approaching it from, you know, I went through this, it was a big struggle, but I came through stronger on the other side and I was fortunate. And again, these are my words that I had somebody there, or I found something to facilitate that and help me now in the back of her book. Uh, and I want to say that the book is not too long. I mean, it's about 245, 250 pages worth of reading. She's got a list of resources of all the different apologetics books that she, that she looked through and read through to get a better understanding. She even lists out different uh, podcasts and, you know, and they're broken down by, at least the books are by subject and where, where related. And, and that alone would probably be worth the, um, price of the book, whatever it was. And then she's got a discussion guide in the back so that if you were going to do a book club or a book reading on this, you can talk about it. So again, I think it's really, really um, worth your while to read it. And so I wanted to jump in a couple spots here. And I, again, I apologize having to redo this and kind of a little flustered with my voice just hanging on. So she talks about the attack on historical Christianity. She talks about the redefinition of things. She talks about how there is this urge or push to quote, fix things that we didn't really think were broken. And the idea that this progressive pastor who's putting on her all these different things went very similar to what I, what I can only imagine must go on in some of the um, progressive churches, right? They redefine things. They question things. They don't give you an opportunity to have an answer without peppering you with a bunch of more doubtful or doubtful challenges, I guess maybe I should phrase it. That's not really a way to nurture and build up somebody. That's more of a way to break somebody down. So I know I've often reference the idea of a progressive Christianity or the hmm, rejection of Christianity. And that's why I think her title is very apropos. They have another gospel. They have another version of Christianity. They have another idea. And she doesn't get into it here but certainly sets the stage for things that she's done in her podcast or other people that would run with it. But just the idea, well, this progressive Christianity didn't come from nowhere and it is kind of a circular returning issue. I had a conversation um, within the last few weeks where I was talking about this coming out of one of the great awakenings, right? The social gospel, if you will. And they, they reorientate what things are important. They redefine what, you know, is prem, what the premise should be. Her, her takeaway is that a lot of what they do has to do with utilizing <laughs> logical fallacies, I guess would be the way I would go with it. Now, the one thing that I wanted to do is kind of re- go through something here that I ran across and I think it's a fair way of approaching some of this. She talked about the idea that she had built a Lego um, character. It was a dragon with her child. And when they built the dragon, they put it up for display and somehow get knocked and it fell and it broke. And when they were trying to figure out how to put it back together, they had to basically take it apart 
or deconstructed, if you will, to the point where they could figure out where to rebuild it from. And in the course of doing that, they ran across the situation where they had put something in wrong or it didn't get, or, or a piece was missing. And that weakened the structure and it made it susceptible to breaking like it did when it fell. And it was only after they went back to the instruction manual and had taken it back apart so they could rebuild it according to the manual, which she said, incidentally, the manual was correct. We had built it up wrong. And once it was rebuilt, not only did the dragon look better, more complete, it was stronger and it was not susceptible to breakage. Now, she used that as an analogy to what she went through. And I think that's uh, uh, very appropriate. And uh, so I guess now that I've gone through that. On, uh, let's see here, page 142, she's talking about how the gospel writers and the eyewitnesses and why they can be trusted or not trusted. It was interesting that she was saying (laughs) that the Bible more or less portrays these guys as dimwitted and cowards. In other words, they don't, they're not the best people to write the New Testament. A couple of the examples she used, they never seem to get what Jesus is talking about. They fall asleep when they were urged to pray. They're scolded by Jesus. They disagree with each other. They run away and hide like cowards when Jesus is arrested. They disown Jesus. And both the Jewish leaders and Jesus' disciples constantly doubt him. But then she talks about how the gospel writers weren't afraid to break convention and even invite some ridicule. So this is kind of contradicting some of the challenges put forth. She talks about, well, all four gospels record that the first witness was a woman. And, you know, that's not even allowed in court. And some very demanding sayings and difficult details. Again, this is page 144. I, I'm not going to go through this. I, like I said, I apologize. I just, I had to get something out today. I, I missed a day. <clears throat> it's been, it's been a challenge. It has been a challenge. And then the other thing that I want to make sure I go back to is she uses the analogy or the explanation, if you will, that they, nothing new being under the sun, right? They have these different wrapper, or I'm sorry, same wrappers, but different candies. In other words, there, she talks about the Judaizers. She talks about the Gnostics and let's see, what was the third one here? I apologize. And the Markinites. And just how the, this stuff's already been, this has already happened. It's already been dealt with, you know, 1500 years ago, but here we go. We got the same kind of stuff going on. Nothing new under the sun. Now <clears throat> I, w- I want to also key in real quick here. <sighs> she talks about the emergent movement briefly and how it was influential in the early two thousands, um, in the evangelical church. She names a number of the people that were involved, one of which is a guy that she references multiple times and just talked about how the entirety of the emergent church eventually undid itself. And that kind of morphed into the progressive Christianity in part. And again, there she's done a very thorough job of telling her story in the context of all these things going on. And she then goes through and shows where she learned how to rebut these ideas. And she understood why they were fallacies. She's understood why they're just the same idea brought back around again. And again, it, it, <clears throat> it is worth your effort to go buy the book and read it. And it gives you a really good understanding, in my opinion, of some of the things that are going on right now. They've had roughly 20 years to imbue an entire generation of people to basically doubt the very thing that they were raised with, to question whether or not they were right. And 
interestingly enough, there's nothing new there. There's there's nothing worthy really of serious thought because it's, all this stuff has been rebutted. And again, she she has a, an opening by uh, Lee Strobel here. Uh, he wrote the forward. Now, for those of you that don't know who Lee Strobel is, he is a guy that went to go investigate and basically disprove Christianity. And through his own research, it convinced him. Again, so <clears throat> why do I do this? Or why am I connecting this? You may recall I, I recently did an, uh, an episode where I was talking about the book Radical. Now, in some ways, David Platt has kind of gone off in a different direction over time. If anything, from what I can see, Alyssa Childers had the challenge, kind of got pulled aside, and has brought it back. And she's coming back stronger and with a much cleaner, better vision. And she does, it, in my opinion, a better job of articulating Christianity with its historical basis than a good number of the well-known pillar pastors that are out there. It's been, it's been challenging for me personally because people that I've always looked up to, at least with a certain amount of respect... If they failed, they faltered. They're they're now questioning what it is they did, and it's it's extremely disappointing. And it kind of hits close to home in in my own life that when you know people and you would expect that they know better, they're dishonoring themselves, their life's work, their families. And I just don't know how you wrap your head around that. I don't. I don't know how it is that you can do something for 40 years and then at one point just say, well, yeah, I got that wrong. Last thing I want to kind of touch base on here as I wrap this up, I do freely admit there are lots of things that we Protestants don't agree with. We don't agree with each other on, and we certainly don't agree with either the Orthodox or the Catholic churches, and then when you start throwing in the Oriental Church and the Coptic churches, I mean, there's, there's even more differentiation at play there. One of the things I find very interesting is in a conversation, somebody all but admitted that the Protestants are always looking to reform. And they're, they're, they were the reformers, and they're always reforming. And I, and I largely agree. I mean, I, I wouldn't rebut that. I, but what I find interesting is when the other faiths in our stream, the Orthodox, the Coptic, the Orientals, they depend upon their tradition as well as the word of God, whereas the Reformers said, no, no, sola scriptura, right? We only need the Bible. That opened up a way where people could reinterpret things as they saw fit, that they redefined what was important, that they tossed out the things that they didn't like or made them uncomfortable. Whereas the longer that a faith was actually active within Christianity, and I'm going to set aside, I don't want to say all of Catholicism, but certainly there's been some things going on there that make me rather uncomfortable. And I'm not Catholic. So for somebody that is Catholic and you've got your uh, hippie Pope in there, you've got to be wondering, where are we going next? So tradition matters, but tradition has to also be based on what was taught in the scripture, what was brought forth from the apostles. And there's a danger there because you can get things off kilter. You can be off a, a pers- you know, that percentage or that degree. And then you fast forward 2000 years and well, well now you're a great distance off. That's a, that's a fair point. That's something that we need to understand. So again, why do this? Well, I've never hid the fact where my faith was. I've never hid the fact or been shy about the fact that, you know, in my opinion, you know, Christ is Lord over everything. And while we have governments and while we have, you know, politics and we have people, you know, we're going to be to some degree left to our own devices, but we want to be honoring and we want to be respectful. And in today's day and age, when you're redefining what Christianity is, what it says, what it teaches to suit the world's needs, and you make that narrow path wide and easy, you're leading a lot of people to destruction. And while there aren't always solutions in politics, I believe the vast majority of human problems can be addressed and or completely fixed 
through pro- proper application of scriptural precepts. In the class I'm taking care taking right now, they talk about it as building a bridge. In other words, this is what the context was in the historical time. How does that relate to the here and now? There's some of the challenges right there, but it's consistent and it doesn't change application. It might, our understanding might change. My concern and my fear is that when your understanding is informed by progressive Christianity, by deconstructionism, by all these other various things, the standpoint, the standpoint of pesiology, pesiotomy, eh, whatever. When, when it's when you put more faith on the idea that you must be getting it wrong because you're a cultural European, I mean, I, I just think that's silly. The faith grew up primarily in North Africa, uh, East Asia, if you will, or I should say West Asia, if you will, and Europe. And it kind of bifurcated and then trifurcated and quadfurcated. I mean, but we all agree on a, a great deal of essential things. And it's only when you start arguing about the things that maybe aren't necessary that we run into these battles. And I think that's where the progressives latch on to. That's where the people that want to rewrite what Christianity is. That's where the other gospels show up. And we have to be very careful about that. And we have to watch ourselves and we have to be aware One of my greatest concerns for the young people I've worked with in the past is if they don't understand what they believe and why they believe what they believe, they're going to be cast into a world of hurt when they go off on their own. And that, and if anything, if, if that was going to criticize the church with the scare quotes up, that would be it. We do not do that well. And I would probably put most of that load on Protestants because for better or for worse, a lot of the mainline old denominations do do their catechisms and stuff like that. But even then, they understand it. They've recited it. It's it's memorized, but I don't think they understand what the method is behind that. If you don't understand some basics of the Greek mythology or even Roman mythology, in the in the Babylonian and Egyptian root, or roots of a lot of the spiritualism, some of this stuff doesn't make sense. And then when you re-inject that spiritualism in today's day and age, people don't know what it is and don't see it for what it is. And I think she does a really good job of addressing how that has come to be and why it shows up and why you have to guard yourself on that. I have really nothing negative to say about this. I mean, I'm, I was very happy with the book. I'm very glad that my wife uh, coaxed me into reading it. And uh, if there are any ladies out there that uh, are listening to me, um, I know a lot of guys don't like to listen to women for certain subjects and certain things. I get it. Uh, but ladies, if you, if you listen and you're impressed, you are probably the one that's going to convince your man to give it a try and listen. And uh, kind of open your mind, if you will. She's done a real nice job. And she's done lots of study on all of this. And she kind of talks about all the different things she's gone through. And when she lists out all of her references, I can only assume she's read the vast majority of that or at least familiarized herself with what's in there. And that's in and of itself impressive for anybody. Um, so in any case, that's all I got for today, folks. Until th- Until tomorrow, I will see you. Well, I guess... I should put, I'm just gonna put this out in here, folks. If, if my voice holds up, my body holds up, I'll be back for a special episode on Saturday. There's just a whole lot of things going on in the world. And I, I'm going to kind of break convention and talk about things going on in the world beyond the great state of Texas. So if I can make that happen, I'll see you on Saturday. If not, I'll be back on Monday or as I say on the other side.